known Sam uh, for, for many years. Um, Sam has actually uh, worked with uh, uh, Disney Imagineering. He's worked with uh, a lot of different things. He comes as an urban planner. That's, uh, that's what he does for a living, making the world better. And that, and that is his uh, goal. And he's certainly going to make the world better tonight by talking uh, to us on uh, his book. It's not even his latest book. His latest book that he just passed out little flyers for you is Universal versus Disney. So you can get into the entire history of uh, Universal Studios as well as uh, those challenges when Michael Eisner decided to create uh, the Disney MGM Studios. Um, Sam is an entertaining fellow, a knowledgeable fellow, an accurate person, and uh, has been in Florida for the uh, past couple of days uh, uh, just sharing his knowledge. But I know for a fact, because I had dinner with him, and he is giving me his extra pizza that is left over. <laughs> uh, that he has something very special for us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Sam Genoway. I brought my I brought my California Adventure food and wine twins. shirt, and we would have we would have been like you know the the, yeah. the Bobsy twins for Halloween. Yeah. We would have been there for Halloween. You just would have to grow up. Because I picked the winner, so we were one. one. You have the same <laughs> hair, pepper hair. Do you want me to? I can talk loud, or do you want me to use this? Uh, if you don't, if you don't hear me, then I can wander and have some fun with this. And I think we're gonna turn the lights down. But before we turn the lights down, not that I want to get a commercial in, but. I'd like to offer all of you, we're going to be selling the book afterwards, so please buy it so that I don't have to take them home with me to Los Angeles. Even at break, right? right? You'll be selling the book at break out there? At uh, break. Break. Yes, at break. Yeah. That's when I'm going to be doing it, I guess. All right, well, welcome to the Disneyland story, the unofficial guide to the evolution of Walt Disney's dream, the longest title ever for a book. But then again, that's because the publisher wants to make sure that when you search on Amazon, you'll be able to see everything and it'll come on up. Uh, why did I write a book about Disneyland? Well, I grew up in Whittier, California, which wasn't very, very far away from Disneyland. Here I am with the boss. This is with the book that I spoke with you guys the last time I was here, Walt and the Promise of Progress City, which was a three-dimensional, it was a look at Walt's interest in environmental design. Kind of an academic book, but it's been used now as a textbook at a number of colleges, and it's given me the pleasure of being able to speak at places like Cal State Fullerton, USC, UCLA, Cal State Northridge, and a number of colleges and universities around the country, and even coming to Florida, oddly enough, to speak in front of your governor for the Floridians for Better Transportation Conference as the keynote address in June to remind the transportation experts in Florida that Central Orlando exists because of you and because of Walt Disney. That realistically, if it wasn't for Walt Disney World, everybody would be still living around the coast right. with the few cows that were in the middle of this in the state. And that Walt changed everything with regards to transportation. So I was very pleased and honored that they invited me to, uh, to speak before a bunch of legislators as well. So uh, with that being said, and then the Universal book we'll, we'll get into in a little bit, how did I get into Disneyland? For those who have not heard this story before, there was a ride, once upon a time, that was just absolutely brilliant. It was known as the Carousel of Progress. Yeah. Not to be mistaken with the version that's here today. Okay, yeah. yeah. No, let's please give an applause yeah. to Carousel. Let's give it up for Carousel of Progress. Um, at the time, this was probably the closest show that really, really, I think, summarized what Walt Disney was all about. He was all about curiosity, he was all about technology, he was all about entertainment, and his goal was to entertain you with technology without you necessarily focusing on the technology. And I do think that for the 64, 65 World's Fair, the greatest example, uh, along with Mr. Lincoln, had to be Carousel of Progress, where you started with technology about the 1890s, well before electricity and how good life is and how it's just going to get better. Then we're into the late 20s when we have our first electrical appliances and we all remember how everything was plugged into one socket. The fuse had to keep going out. Then we move up a little bit into the late 1940s, 1950s, about the time Disneyland was starting, and everything is looking sleeker. And then the one portion of the show that was different in California, well, two parts, that was different in California than it was in, in uh, the New York show was the very final scene. Now, I grew up in a lower blue collar family, and we didn't have much money, but my mom <laughs> loved Disneyland, and what she would do is that about once a month, 
Uh, I'm as old as the Matterhorn, so you guys can figure out the math. Uh, about once a month, she would take myself and my two much older brothers to Disneyland. She would buy the general admission ticket, which at the time was very inexpensive. It was designed to keep the riffraff out, but to not prevent lower blue collar families like myself to get in. Now, what we couldn't afford is we couldn't afford any of the tickets for the rides, and we couldn't afford any of the food. So we always ate out of the trunk of the car, and then as far as the rides, I just kept going on the four free rides at the time. Great moments with Mr. Lincoln, so I could give you the speech. Um, America the Beautiful, so I can turn around and watch being run over by the uh, colonial band. Uh, adventures through inner space. I'll just leave it at that. But I was young. I was young at Adventures Through Inner Space. So I, I, I appreciated it for its scientific aspects, not the surreal, you know, ooh, shrink it down to the size of a molecule. And then my favorite was Carousel of Progress. And at the end of the show, as you recall, the ride didn't just go from the, into, a, into a store or just an exit like we do today. No. You were invited to walk up on the stage, and then you were invited to take a ride up a speed ramp. And at the top of the speed ramp was this, the city of Progress City, the model of Progress City. To give you an idea of how big this model is, it was 6,900 square feet. I'm going to say that the room that we're in probably right now is about 1,500 square feet. So could you imagine a model that's about four times the size of this room? It had 24,000 trees, 2,400 moving vehicles. The, the buildings that are at the very front of the thing even had furniture in it so you can look into the windows. I'm like an 8 to 12 year old boy. I'm going nuts. By the time this thing's going around the final scene, I'm already edging out of my chair. I'm getting ready to go on the stage. I'm ready to go run up there. And then I'm the guy who is the kid who is always doggling behind and letting everybody pass because I wanted to soak up all five and a half minutes that I was allowed to look at this model. That was the inspiration for the first book, Progress City, which turned out to be a feasibility study to see if Walt's vision of, uh, of Epcot would have worked. And the final evidence is quite simple. Yes, in fact, I would dare say that according to Harrison Buzz Price, who did the economic research for the project, it would have twice the number of visitors that Disney World has today. Uh, in fact, the Mall of America, and the forum shops have more visitors per year than Walt Disney World does. Could you imagine Walt Disney doing one of those two shopping centers in his style? And you can see why it was going to have a huge turnout. Love this mall. This is what got me into this whole hobby of, of understanding Disney. So I, as a kid growing up, I wanted to write something that was a little more uh, lighthearted than Progress City, which is a, a very serious book about design. And I wanted to go to something that I really, really always adored, which was Disneyland. But Disneyland, so many people have written so many books, it was very hard for me to figure out what could I do that was different. So I was very fortunate one day. I was having lunch with Diane Disney Miller at the Walt Disney Family Museum. I was given the great privilege of doing a speech with her husband, Ron, about Mineral King, the ski resort. And before we were doing the talk, we sat down and we had lunch, and we were having Walt's chili in the boardroom of the Walt Disney Family Museum. As a fanboy, it's the ultimate geeking out. That's all I can say. So I was loving it. We were talking about the park and Diane was sort of suggesting that the way that her dad looked at the park was really like her younger brother. He, he loved it. He modeled it. He wanted to keep changing it. He spent a lot of time trying to teach his guys good values, good rules so that they could carry on. And that's where the idea came from of writing a biography as if Disneyland was its own thing, his own living being, because you know what it really is. It is the reason why Walt wanted to build it. It's because he wanted to be able to change it, to allow it to evolve. And then it struck me what's really remarkable is that Walt Disney died when his child was 11 years old. So how did something that was so personal, a vision that was so personal, able to continue and survive and thrive after the father's death? And that was a fascinating subject, and that's what really sponsored them got the book started. So the first thing was stumbling forward. <coughs> Why did Walt want to build Disneyland in the first place? Pretty simple. By 1948, 1949, Walt Disney Productions was really sucking air. It wasn't doing very well. He had a lot of success, a lot of limited successes with his full-length animated features. You know, Snow White was a big hit. Pinocchio, not so much. Fantasia, not so much. Dumbo, yes. <coughs> but as big of a hit as Dumbo was, it was still missing half of the world because of World War II. Right, Jim? Mm hmm Okay. So by 1948, 1949, Mickey Mouse was a has-been. Uh, Tom and Jerry was a huge hit. They were competing against the HPA films, and they were competing and losing all the Oscars to other studios. Walt was pretty depressed about this. I don't think that Walt was thinking that his studio was going to exist. 
He knew he had to do something. He knew he had to get into live action at some point because that was going to be faster than the animated features. The little program films that he was doing were not doing bang up business either. So he was looking back like he always did and he was thinking, what can I do that something I really love. And he loved amusement parks. As a little boy, he loved amusement parks. With his daughters, he loved amusement parks. His wife, uh, Lillian, didn't like amusement parks because they were very, very dirty. But that's what was the inspiration, is he knew that if he could create an amusement park that his wife, Lillian, would want to go to, that he'd have a lot of other people coming to it. Plus, his wife told him he couldn't have a train anymore in his backyard. And that was very frustrating, because then he wanted to buy Ward Kimball's train. He wouldn't sell it. And that was frustrating. And then he wanted to buy a train from, I kid you not, a guy named uh, um, Casey Bill. Um, and uh, and he, that guy wouldn't sell his train either. And that one's now up in Gilroy, California. So Walt started doing a lot of research about public spaces. And when they would go on vacations, his daughter would suggest that occasionally her dad would just sort of tune out on everything. And he'd just start walking. And what he was doing is he was counting steps. He was counting how long things were, how wide things were. He was measuring how tall things were. He was getting very, very, very interested in the whole idea of doing an amusement park, some sort of a place where people could get together, some sort of a park, building on his idea of the Mickey Mouse Club Park that he was starting to develop in the 30s. So that was stumbling forward. How does it, what was it? What was the inspiration? As typical in Walt Disney, the greatest inspiration is desperation. He always rose to the challenge. Look what happened with Mickey Mouse. He rose to the challenge. The same thing with Disneyland. Rose to the challenge. They did a lot of research. As much as he, uh, as much as he does, he researched everything. He was reading everything. He was visiting people. They were doing focus groups with theme park or amusement park operators from around the country. He was constantly being told that his ideas were crazy and wacko and not going to work. And every time somebody told him that, he just got more and more bold and thought his idea was right on the money. Because if these professionals couldn't see it, he knew he was onto something really new. And that was the creation of Disneyland. And then he was hands-on. For the first few years, he was there pretty much every Saturday morning. He would drive down from Burbank on Friday night, stay at the apartment above the fire station, slide down in his bathrobe, hop in the fire truck, drive around, look around, get with his guys, his management team. They would walk around the park in the morning. They would point. They would talk out things. They would work out stuff. Then comes lunchtime. They're all big hamburger fans, so they would leave property because they didn't sell alcohol at Disneyland. And of course, you have to have your drink with your burger. So they would leave property and they would continue their meeting. And then Walt would come back, go up to the fire station again, take off his outfit, put on his, uh, his overalls, and then he would go down to the railroad and he would run the railroad in the afternoon. And I did see the logs. And for the most part, from 56 to 58, if you were there on a Saturday afternoon, there was a pretty good chance that Walt Disney was your engineer on your train. That's what he spent his Saturday afternoons doing, was driving his train around the park. Um, he liked doing that with the monorail, too, I just learned recently. I did not know that until just recently. Um, then came Walt's Disneyland. This is the Disneyland, I think, that for this group we all remember the most. This is the Disneyland from the television programs. This is with the great big beautiful tomorrow, Pirates of the Caribbean, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and that was Walt's Disneyland. And then he passed away in 66, and then it was a matter of momentum. Haunted Mansion was already in place. There were other projects that were already moving forward in the pipeline. Those were the projects that were starting to be realized. Afterwards, it was simply a case of carrying on. How do we keep Disneyland alive? How do we keep it thriving? Some critics of the park suggest that the 70s was kind of a dull period for the park. But, you know, I don't think so because that's where Big Thunder Mountain Railroad came about. That's where Space Mountain came about. There's a lot of really good things that came about during that time. And that's because whenever they would follow Walt's good values that he taught his child Disneyland, they would succeed. Then there came new ideas. There was Michael Eisner and Frank Wells became in charge of the company. And they looked at Disneyland a little bit differently. They didn't look at it as a show where you want to fill the theater and just keep building and building. What they looked at it as more of a real estate play and the opportunity to maximize every square footage for the dollar, get rid of the undervalued spaces. And that's a really smart thing to do as a businessman. It's pretty, it's pretty much opposite of what most show people think. But it did keep the thing alive and it made it thrive over the years. And the company spent a lot of money during this time. And then finally, by 2000, it was no longer Disneyland. It was the Disneyland Resort. And the idea was to become the mini Walt Disney World. Let's have multiple hotels, 
connected by transportation with multiple theme parks so that people will stay for multiple days. We don't really care about the Southern California audience as much. We're really trying to attract an audience like Walt Disney World. And that's where we are still today, where Disneyland is really a resort with two theme parks and hotels as opposed to one park. But uh, DCA, California Adventure, was birthed by different parents, and so I don't really get into the design of that one very much. Who knows? Maybe there's a, there's a book for you, Jim. Do the history of Disney's California yeah. Adventure, okay? You, you could do that one. Or do the history. If somebody needs to write the history of the show at Disneyland, because that's not me either, but I, I think there's a lot of stuff that's there. So when, after writing a book like this, all the research that I had done, and to give you kind of an idea of how geeky the book is, it has over 840 citations. Uh, it's the most documented Disney book that's been written, I understand, and that's why it's being used as a college textbook in a few places. Um, because of that, there's a few things that really jumped out of my brain that, that made me go, wow, is that really the case? So I'm going to take you through a few of those right now. First, change it changes. How did they find the property? Well, they hired a guy named Harrison Buzz Price, who worked for a Stanford Research Institute. Walt came, created a company for him called ERA. Never worked for Walt directly, but his name is on a window at Main Street at Disneyland Today, one of the very few non-Disney employees. And he was hired by Walt to find the perfect location for Disneyland. And this was not an arbitrary property search. What Buzz did is he looked at eight counties in Southern California, came up with a number of factors, looking for a certain amount of acreage, a single property owner, generally flat land, not near a military base, a garbage dump or cemeteries, those sorts of things. Then they ran the numbers because they wanted to find the place that had the best weather, the least amount of smog, the best breezes, and what they ended up doing after Buzz crunched thousands and thousands of numbers using a slide rule and a spreadsheet is he found a location in La Mirada, a location in Anaheim that came up about three weeks before the study finished. And that property had 14 property owners, so it didn't fit the mix originally, but a guy told them about this property. So they looked at this, and then they well, wanted to go see the property, so they drove down, and they took them to one property first that was right across the street from a cemetery, a Catholic cemetery. And Walt looked at it and instantly said, I don't think my park would work very well across the street from a cemetery, so let's look at something else. Then they drove to the Ball subdivision. To give you an idea of how good Buzz Price was with these numbers, is that he had predicted that in 25 years, the, cent the, the population center in Southern California would be very close to this property. The problem was he was wrong. What he did is he missed it by two miles. 25-year <laughs> projection, numbers handwritten using a slide rule. He predicted the population the center of Southern California off only by two miles. He's also the guy who figured out where Walt Disney World should be as well, too. So we all like Buzz Price now, don't we? Mm -hmm. So they went through, and they went through the process to buy the property. And so the first property they were looking for in the Ball subdivision was right up here. Um, you kind of see like a little track sort of thing, and it's right up in here. And they looked at the property, and, and uh, you know, Walt kind of kept to the back. At the time, it wasn't necessarily a lot of people knew who he was. They liked the property. They decided they wanted to make a deal, so they put a $10,000 deposit down. Uh, to get the, do the ball rolling. Then they went to Knott's Berry Farm to have chicken, because Walt really liked Knott's Berry Farm chicken. So they were over there having chicken. And while they were having chicken, there was a guy that was sitting behind them that overheard them talking about this property, and he very quickly got up and finished his chicken and ran over to this property owner, and he said, do you know who it is that just gave you a deposit for your property? It's that guy, Walt Disney, you know, the movie guy, the cartoon guy. He's going to buy your property for something. This guy went, really? Maybe I should sell it for more money. So they all come back from lunch. They're having a meeting. They're talking with the guy. The guy goes, well, I've reconsidered. I think I might need to raise the price. Walt was so frustrated because he thought he had made a deal with the guy in the morning. And then when the guy reneged on the deal, instead of even just being mad, he just walked away. He walked away from his $10,000 deposit. He walked away from the property. He walked away from Anaheim. He started thinking he's going to be building Disneyland in La Mirada. It was this guy, Keith Murdoch, the city manager of Anaheim, who came and saved the day for the city. Because what Keith Murdoch wanted is he loved Disney. He thought they would be really good for the city. Also, Anaheim had a relationship with Disney. In 1953, it was Disney artists that created the floats for the Anaheim Halloween Parade. So they were familiar with the government. They liked the government in Anaheim as well. And Keith Murdoch figured out what Walt needed to do is, first of all, 
there's a series of large electrical uh, uh, electrical transmission lines that are south of the property. They're still there today. They've just been moved a little bit more south. They went along the bottom. He knew that Walt needed a location north of those electrical lines so that he'd have a straight shot to Mount Wilson for live television broadcast. So he figured, okay, so if you don't want that property, maybe if we slip this down just one set of properties and go down all the way to Catella, that would work, but then there was a street in the way, a street called Cerritos that ran right through the middle of the property. And Cerritos wasn't just a little street. Cerritos was a county-owned highway that was going to become the major thoroughfare. Catella, which we think of today as a major thoroughfare, was in fact only going to be a minor road. Cerritos was going to be the main way of getting over towards the freeway. So what, what, what Kurt Keith Murdoch had to do was to figure out a way of taking a public road and giving it for free to a private, and an, and a, mm -hmm. a private entity mm -hmm. and not charging for it and doing it under the slide. Mm -hmm. And you know what? He did it. He convinced him. Mm -hmm. Wall asked him, he says, if you can get rid of that road, I'll go ahead and do your deal and we'll move in Anaheim. Mm -hmm. So Keith Murdoch, he's the guy. And so here's a drawing from the newspaper that uh, the Anaheim Bulletin, when they announced that Disneyland was coming, and you can see that here's that little track, here's where the road was, they slipped the whole property down one section, that's why here is Catella, that's why it is where it is today. It was this guy figuring out what was really important to Walt. So that's how they found the property, that's how they made the deal with the 14 property owners. And for the very first property owner, here's the deed trust, and they made a deal with the first property owner. What they asked, uh, the first property owner asked was, you know, we have some younger daughters, they want to stay on the property, you know, we know you need most of the farmland, but we have a lovely little house that's just off of Harbor, uh, maybe they can keep the house, and so Walt said, yeah, yeah, they, they can go ahead and keep the house, that's fine, and then they got all the other properties and the deal was done, so the first day of construction, this was the 50s, remember, what they did is started to remove the 12,000 orange trees and walnut trees, and it was the 50s, so what do you do, you pile them up in a big pile, right, and get a little gasoline, pour a little gasoline yeah. on the trees, right, like take your cigarette you were probably smoking at the time and toss it on the fire and you just burn the trees down, right? That's the way that we did this sort of clearance in the 1950s. Except for the wind changed and the wind sort of shifted and the trees were a little bit close to the house and darn it if the house didn't burn down. Yes, the house burned down. Oops, I guess we can't have the house. I saw a note from Todd James Pierce, he showed me. They actually burnt it down on purpose. I did not know that when I wrote the book. So they, they burnt the people's house down. And today if you're at Disneyland where the little transportation circles are um, off of Harbor Boulevard, kind of near the front of the park, that's where the house used to be. So they burnt it down. To show you just how much of an outback Anaheim was at the time, this is a picture of where the five freeway is and the Catella off-ramp, and this is Catella. <laughs> Disneyland is over there someplace. There was no highway, there was no freeway when the park <laughs> opened, and this was, to show you, a little, little bit more than a month before the park actually opened. That's what people saw. So if you imagine you're up in LA and you're driving down to Orange County and you're going, where is this place? It probably reminds many of you the first time you went to Walt Disney World in the 70s and you started driving on property and driving on property and thinking you're going to drive into a swamp until about two, two and a half miles away you saw the, the glimmer of the castle on the top. But up until that point, am I right? It was like, it was like a scary drive, wasn't it? Because it was in the middle of nowhere. Well, this was in the middle of nowhere in an urban environment. And here's one of the first photos of the property being cleared. The house used to be over there. And that's, these are the couple of houses that they did move for the folks. And the property itself has always been a fascinating subject to watch. It's the train I always thought was like a belt. And every time that the park wanted to get a little bit fatter, um, they decided to move the belt out, which was the train track. So here's a photo shortly after the park opened in 1955. We give it a couple of years, and we see the very first addition to Disneyland is for a new land, and it's a thing called Holiday Land, right out here. It was a corporate event center that had a little hole that you could cut through the, the berm and get right into the park. So when you had corporate parties, this was also the first land to close at Disneyland, and, and it never made its return. So that's Holiday Land. Now let's skip forward about um, 1890, uh, 1989 or so. You can see that the track has moved out more than 200 feet. Mm -hmm on one side, about 75 feet on the top, and the other two sides have always been the same. So the park's like a belt and keeps getting fatter and fatter, and it's about as fat as it can get inside. That'll work. Uh, that's a phrase that Walt used. It was probably the best compliment you could get if you worked for him in any of his companies. 
This is something I'm sure you're all familiar with. And I also am just going to pause for a second and say, for you who, who don't notice this, I've got to say the job of the hut costume is incredible. <laughs> and it's just weirding me out enough from this talk. So just want to let you know. If I'm occasionally getting flipped out, I'm looking over and I've got Job of the Hutt and Darth Vader looking at me. And it's just it's making me a little little nervous. So thank you very much for freaking me out. He's got a lightsaber and he's not afraid to use it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's why I have you here. All right, so um, this is a memo that was sent to Walt Disney about three weeks before the park had opened. And it was about this plaque. This plaque is like the ultimate statement, don't you think? Everything about the parks worked really well with this. But that's not enough for Paul. Well, here it is. This is his handwriting. So if you ever want to know what his handwriting looks like. And what he did is he actually drew out what the size of the plaque should be and what its shape should be, where it should be over the train tunnel. And then he changed a few of the words. It was only 13 words. But by changing a couple of words, he completely changed the, set, the meaning. It went from Disneyland, where you leave today, he figured you're already here. You don't need to tell people where you're going, you just need to let them know you're here. And today you're leaving today, and you're going to visit, and then he put these things in a slightly different order because it worked right for him. So just a couple of little tweaks, a couple of words, completely changed the meaning of that plaque. And that plaque is the ultimate vision statement for all of the castle parks. There is, of course, the Santa Fe and Disneyland Railroad, very different than it was today. And they had a little bit of an issue one day. Actually, they had kind of issues with this a fair, a fair amount of times. The original trains were the C.K. Holiday and the E.P. Ripley. And they were basically blow-up models of Walt's backyard train uh, that he had, the, which was based off of a train which is currently on display at the California State Rail Museum in Sacramento. It's an American uh, 440. And uh, this is the number one train, the CK Holiday. And this really is a 5 8 scale version of Walt's 1 8 scale train. It's got the diamond stack, so it's supposed to be the country train. And this is a train that you took, and you always boarded it at Frontierland, and you took a complete loop around the park, and then you exited Frontierland. It didn't stop at multiple stops. And it was a lovely train. And the cars that it carried were, were kind of unique and kind of controversial as well, too. You see, doesn't that look a little like a cattle car? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know why? Because it's a, it's a cattle car. You see, they decided that Walt decided he wanted to do state cars. He wanted to do cattle cars. And there were a couple of problems with it. And the first one was, and these were conversations he had with Ward Kimball. Uh, the first problem that he had with it was that uh, Ward said, well, you know, Walt, everybody's standing. And if you have to hit the air brake, you know, they're all going to go tumbling and fall right on top of each other. And that's not really very safe. Walt's answer was very quick and very, very succinct. And it was, he just won't hit the brake. <laughs> <laughs> so with that argument done, and Ward knew not to really argue with Walt when he made up his mind, then they got into a discussion about the cattle cars themselves. And what, what Ward Kimmel noticed is that Walt was having them space the boards in between about eight inches. And Ward's like, oh man, that's going to be horrible. Why don't you like, make them bigger? Make them 14 inches or something so people can look out. And Walt got livid with him again and looked at him and said, Ward, I want people to feel like the cows on the train so they can experience that. So that's how it is. To, that's how it was. Standing room only and looking out of a cattle car and hoping and praying the engineer didn't hit the air brake or all these people tumble. So that's how the original train was on the, on the, the cattle car side. Then there was the E.P. Ripley, which was the city train that you took from Main Street Station. And this was the city train. You can see with the coal stack and of the diamond stack. And the original cars are not like they are today, open air cars, but they were real goodness, honest to goodness train cars. Not necessarily 5.8 scale. They were actually a six foot door is what they modeled them after. But there were a lot of problems with this because it was a door in the front, door in the back, a center aisle. It took a lot of time to load people, unload people. If you were on this side of the train, it was pretty cool because you got a view of everything. If you're on that side of the train, there wasn't really much of a view of anything. So those poor people didn't get much. Walt wanted to give them some sort of a treat. So he wanted to demonstrate technology, rail technology at the time. So what he would do is have the CK Holiday come over, hit a siding, go on the siding and then pass over and pass by the E.P. Ripley's cars. And this gave people a chance to see the locomotive and all those poor people stuffed in the cattle cars standing up wishing they were in the train that was enclosed and they were sitting down. And it was a wonderful idea except for one problem on one day. 
they were going through and there was a relatively new brakeman on it. And the idea is that the brakeman had to jump off, he had to go run over, hit the switch, then the train would go over onto the siding and put a pin in the switch to keep the switch where it was supposed to be. So he goes one day and he does that and does what he's supposed to do, but apparently he didn't put the pin in the siding as well as he should have. So the very final cattle car goes over the tracks. The first two wheels go where they're supposed to, they go on the siding. Then the switch switches on its own and the back two wheels start going on the main line so the train starts going at an angle. If the train would have gone another three feet before they stopped it, it is entirely possible that the train would have derailed, it would have rolled over with people standing inside of the cattle car right over the Mickey Mouse floral right behind the front gates. Or right in front of the front gates. So luckily, the guy screwed up, but then he was never seen again. He just walked away. So uh, if it was for that accident, if that was a true accident, it probably would have killed the whole Disneyland thing. And this is something I, I, I almost never, ever show, but I got permission to show it to you guys today. And this is some very, very rare footage Snow. that I hope will work. Snow. It's snow, yeah. Snow, snow.